Accounting Equation and Excel, Invoice Form. Get ready and some coffee because we're getting down to the accounting foundation, the accounting equation with Excel. Here we are in Excel. If you don't have access to this workbook, that's okay because we basically built this from a blank worksheet but started in a prior presentation. So if you want to build this entire worksheet from a blank sheet, you may want to begin back there or you could just construct your own worksheet as you go or possibly just use paper and pencil. But if you do have access to this workbook though, there's currently three tabs. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us but but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff anyways like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line now i'm not saying that subscribing to this channel crunching numbers with us will make you thin fit and healthy or anything however it does seem like it worked for her just saying so you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise so you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. It's down below. Example, practice blank. Example, in essence, the answer key. The practice tab having pre-formatted cells so you can practice the practice problem with less Excel formatting. The blank tab, the one we will be working on, is where we started with a blank worksheet, but basically working with a template at this time, adding to the template as needed let's go to the example tab to get an idea of what we will be doing where we will be going once again recording transactions with the accounting equation this time focusing in on the invoice form the invoice form being the typical form used when we make a sale on account that's typically how you might hear it in a textbook for example remembering the difference between working within a textbook problem and working in a real life situation and possibly with the use of accounting software. When you're using a textbook, we got to make sure that we understand the terminology that is used to indicate certain types of transactions, which is going to be a different indication tool than in actual practice when we'll typically be driven by forms and data input types of fields. So from a textbook standpoint, if we say that we make a sale, the typical two formats of sales could be we made a sale and collected cash at the same point in time, or we made a sale on account. We did the work, for example, in a service type of industry, and they're going to pay us at some future point in time, which some books will say we made a sale on account. The form typically used to indicate a sale made on account is an invoice type form. Remembering though, the invoice like a bill can be used interchangeably and like normal talking, even in an accounting situation, but is more specific when we use those forms as a data input sheet. So in other words, when we say invoice, you got to think about what side of the transaction are we on? What side of the table are we on? Because there's going to be two different companies possibly that are recording transactions. The, purchase, the person that is making the sale, doing the work, for example, and the person that is paying for the goods or services. So when we use the term invoice, we're talking about the side of the table. When we did the work, we did the goods or services for somebody else and are sending out the invoice, which could be interchangeably called sending out a bill in normal type of language. The recipient then is the one that would receive what we would call a bill, even though it might say invoice on it because when we made it, it was an invoice to us. And uh, so they're going to be the uh, recipient would be calling it a, a bill. So from a data input standpoint, however, that, that's what's really important in terms of recording items within accounting software. So it's even more specific, the terminology. When I say invoice from an accounting software situation, I'm talking about the data input field, the form used for data input, even if we don't give that form to anybody else, 
It's the form that's going to be used to record an increase in accounts receivable in essence. And accounts receivable is going to be a type of asset that's not cash. It's something that we want to collect in the future. It is by definition an accrual type of account. So remember that if you're in, a, if you're in certain types of businesses, you might want to be on a cash based system. That's great but some types of businesses are going to force you to do accrual type of things and if you have to do the work first and invoice the client that's going to be driven just by the type of industry you're in right it is what it is that means you're going to have to track the accounts receivable and accounts receivable is an accrual type of component because that results in recording revenue when we do the work not when we received the cash so we'll see how that plays out and then we'll add a little bit more complexity when we have to deal with inventory when we have an invoice. All right, let's go to the blank tab and let's enter a transaction. Now I'm going to start off with our base transaction here, but it looks a little bit different. The 50,000 of the original investment, I'm going to assume is broken out 40% cash and 60% for inventory. So instead of having the whole 50,000 in cash, we broke out 30,000 which is uh, the beginning inventory that we'll start off with, which will be relevant when we make the sale of inventory so we can have a decrease of inventory. Owner's equity is still the 50,000. And then we have our sub ledger over here tracking the units of the inventory, which is what we want to have on the books when we deal with an invoice with inventory. So we'll talk more about that later. But let's start off with a transaction that doesn't have inventory. And this will be the baseline basic transaction possibly more common for businesses that do invoicing because the typical industries you need to invoice for are those where you do the work first and then you have to bill the client for the work done and that might be like almost like a job cost system for service businesses landscaping accounting lawyer work and that kind of thing so let's have a service invoice so we're going to send out an invoice the bill to the client but we're thinking of it on and it makes sale on account that would be the terminology you might see in a textbook meaning we did work and now we're looking to get paid for the work uh, done so so we're sending out the bill which we're calling the invoice okay so our typical questions would be is cash affected because that's the easiest thing to first think about and answer here no cash isn't affected so what are we getting instead of cash we're still getting an asset we're getting an iou so we did work we we're getting an iou that we're recording right now that still has value so i'm going to say it's still going to be an increase to assets now you might say why does it have value if i don't have cash yet you one reason would be wait we have a contract we did work even if it's just a verbal contract and you would think that if they default on the contract we have at least some recourse possibly sell in the accounts receivable to a collection agency or something like that so it's not as good as having cash but we already did the work and have a claim to that cash therefore it's still basically an asset the other side then is going to be on the revenue side over here we're going to call it sales that's what our revenue account is going to be so i'm going to say equals the sales account is going to be going up notice that we're recording revenue not on a cash basis here because we haven't collected the cash but on an accrual basis which is actually kind of more accurate in the sense that we already did the work meaning the cash basis can distort our bookkeeping by distorting the time difference between when we do the work and when we receive the cash on the expense side when we get the goods or services and when we pay the cash whereas if we're on this accrual basis we did the work that's really when we should have the earnings recorded because uh, that's when it has been earned uh, so that's going to be the general idea so cash based system is easier typically but the accrual system is usually thought of to be kind of more accurate in that timing sense and if we have to track accounts receivable we have to use an accrual component because we need this accounts receivable and the related subsidiary ledger which will help us to track who owes us the money allowing us to follow up to make sure that we get paid so let's put some zeros across this thing zero 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 then i'm going to go to the sub ledger over here 
and this is what I the accounts receivable subledger. I'm just going to call this this person A. So this is going to be customer A, right? I know it's very generic, but that's going to be customer A. So I need to track this information also by customer for the subledger. This will often be done automatically in accounting software. So the total is going to be this plus this. So we have a total matching what's in the GL 1,600 and broken out by customer of which we only have one right now that owes us the money of the full uh, 1,600. All right, let's sum this thing up. I'm gonna say this equals the sum of these two. So we don't have cash yet. So I'm gonna say copy that. Let's copy this across. Accounts receivable now going up to 1,600. Our inventory is at the 30,000. Let's paste it here, formulas only. And then we'll paste it across here. The income statement affected, formulas only. Remembering the whole income statement is really part of equity. So what would be reported on the balance sheet under owner's equity would actually be the 51,600, right? Because revenue would increase it. Net income would increase revenue, then increase it. And on the income statement, we would just have the 1,600, no expenses currently uh, recorded for that. Let's copy this down. Let's put this as the balance. And that's not right. Balance. You have to spell it right. And then I'll copy this down. Doot, doot, doot. And then we'll copy this down. And doot, doot, and copy this down. Doot, doot. So now we're back in balance here. If I was to liquidate the company, what would happen? Well, now we've got cash of the 20,000, we've got accounts receivable. No, notice if I liquidated the company, I'd have to collect on the 1,600 still in order to get the cash to put it back in my bank account. We have inventory of 30,000. If I liquidated the company, I'd have to sell the inventory for at least the cost of 30,000 to get the money to then close up the company, right? And this 1,600 has already been earned, but not collected. It's sitting in accounts receivable. So note, this is a common scenario. And it's also, it's often useful to think about the liquidation process to get an idea of what the bookkeeping is doing. I have assets of 51,600, but I can't just liquidate and take that money because of course, I'd still have to go through the process of collecting on the receivables. And maybe I did business with deadbeats that aren't going to pay me in which case I'm going to eat the loss, right? And I'd still have to sell the inventory, in which case if I'm liquidating, I might not be able to do that, which is why I'm liquidating, right? So that's why we have to be careful on valuing the company. That's the equity now represents the book value of the company, but it's not all cash. You can't just easily take out the equity, which is something we have to keep in mind. All right, so then let's try another one on 415. Let's say we sold our uh, inventory so invoice uh, for the sale of inventory. So now we're going to say we, we're invoicing someone for inventory that we sold. Now, if we sold inventory, oftentimes, then you're going to get paid at the same point in time. Like if you're in a store, someone's going to give you some form of payment, check, credit card, debit card, cash for the payment, and you will not be invoicing, but have what you might call a sales receipt type of transaction. And if you're doing online sales, often it works the same way if you're selling to an end customer, meaning they pay you on your website, for example, and then you ship them the goods. But it could work the other way around, meaning if the purchaser has more leverage, then it might be the case that they request the inventory and then you ship them the inventory with basically the invoice in the box, right? They check it, see that everything is lined up and then pay it, right? So you still could have that situation. And we want to practice with inventory because inventory makes the data input process more complex. So let's say we had a sale, sales price of whatever we're selling, uh, inventory items that is of 2,500. So then the, what we need to record this is still going to be the cost of the inventory. And then we could have sales tax that's going to be a, an issue. Let's say the sales tax is 0.05. Let's percentify that 5%. So if, if we have sales tax, the way the sales tax works 
is that, and this would be a usage tax, which might be a primary tax if you're outside of the United States for many federal taxes. In the United States, we have an income tax as the federal tax and the state taxes could use a form of sales tax, which would be a form of usage tax. The idea being we're going to increase the price of the goods that we're selling, but the money isn't going to us in theory. It's going to the government. We're being made into the government's little collection person, right? So <laughs> that's so we have to collect on their on on their behalf. So the theory is the tax is actually on the customer, not not on the business. In economic terms, you might question that and say, who's really paying for the tax? It's kind of hard to tell, but that's the idea. So that means that that when I when I collect on the accounts receivable, we're not only collecting the 2,500, we're collecting the 2,500 plus the 5% tax. So how would we calculate that? It would be something like 2,500 uh, plus 2,500 times the 5% sales tax. So we're gonna have to collect, the receivable is gonna be for $2,625. So then on the other side of things, we've got then the sales side. The sales side is gonna record the other side, but it's only gonna record the amount that we have claim to, the 2,500. You could say, why don't I record the entire amount and then record sales tax expense? The reason it's not supposed to be an expense of the company. We're just the collection person. Therefore, that other amount is off income statement. It never hits the income statement. Instead, if we do it properly and software will help us to do the sales tax and usage tax, it should increase the payable account never hitting the income statement. So I'm going to say that the difference here is going to be on the sales tax payable, which will be 2,500 times 5%. So I can imagine that as like one half of the transaction, right? So now I've got 2,000, uh, 2,625, and then these two add up to on the liability and equity side, 2,625. So we're in balance now, but we're not done because we also have the the um, we also have the cost that we need to deal with. So that's in our sub ledger comes into play over here. Now, remember, if we have inventory, you have a bunch of questions with software that you need to really keep in mind because these are areas as a bookkeeper that you can specialize in or stay away from because they're not what you're specializing in. So in other words, if you sell inventory, are you tracking the inventory inside accounting software? Do you, does the software do the calculations for you and help calculate the sales tax and all that kind of stuff? Or maybe you calculate the uh, inventory outside the software for your accounting and on like your website software, like your Shopify store or something like that, or possibly in an Excel worksheet, adjusting your software on a periodic basis type of system. Also, you have to think about, are you buying inventory specifically for custom jobs, in which case you're applying exactly the inventory that you purchased to the sales, or do you have a bunch of inventory that you're buying, like a Shopify store or something, and then you're selling them as people buy them, you don't know, you're not identifying each specific piece of inventory that you're selling, you're using a flow assumption, like first in, first out, last in, first out, weighted average. We're not gonna get into that in detail here, but just keep those in mind. We're, we're gonna say here, we have inventory of $30,000 on the books. We need a sub ledger tracking that in some way, shape or form by units, not by dollar amount. So we, we got divided by $10 a unit, that's gonna give us uh, the unit of 30,000 30, units. So now I'm gonna imagine that we sold, what did we sell here? Du, 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 du. We sold over here. Uh, the dollar amount, I'll say the dollar amount that we sold was inventory sales, uh, sales price. Uh, wait a sec. I'm going to say that we sold, hold on. Let me put it over here. I'm kind of doing it backwards, but let's say we sold $2,000 worth. And I'm going to put that over here. Duh, 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 duh. This equals... Uh, the 2000 
So how many units would that be? If I say they all cost $10, which I'm assuming all units cost $10, and that, again, would be more complex with a flow assumption, 2,000 over 10, so we sold 200. Usually that would be the other way around, right? We would say we sold 200 items. Uh, the cost was $10, which would not be on the invoice, only the sales price would be on the invoice. But if we're doing a perpetual inventory system, this would be recorded at the same time. And then the, the uh, total units then are gonna be, let's actually make this a negative. We'll do it this way. Let's make this a negative. And then uh, now we have the units, which are going to be this plus this. So we had 3,000 units. We sold 200, 2,800. So if all of those still cost $10, we're currently at $28,000 amount of inventory, which should match what's on our books over here, which it doesn't yet until we record the second part of the transaction. So now I'm going to say the inventory, let's record this in the same area, is going to go down by that uh, 2000. You can think of this as another transaction like entirely, uh, but it's all part of the same thing if you're doing a perpetual inventory system, meaning when you enter the invoice, all of this will be recorded at the same time. However, this 2000 cost component will not be on the invoice and possibly not part of the data input because you will have already done that information like kind of behind the scenes. So it's similar to when you check something out at a grocery store, you see the sales price and the units, but you don't you don't see the cost of goods sold. However, the, the, the system knows the cost and is recording that automatically applying the proper cost flow assumption to do this side of the transaction. So this whole back end of the transaction, again, is something you got to think about. Do you want to deal with setting that up within a software system or, or do you want to do that in some other format using a periodic inventory system, making adjustments to inventory on a periodic basis? Okay, so we're going to say that the inventory is going to go down by the 2000 and then the other side is going to be cost of goods sold which is going to be an expense of the 2000. So note now the cost of goods sold is representing an expense, but it's not being recorded at the point in time that we purchased something for cash, because when we purchased the inventory for cash, we typically put it on the books as an asset. We're recording the expense when we consumed an asset, that asset being inventory. We sold the inventory, we consumed the inventory, we gave away the inventory in the, the process of generating revenue. And that's why it's gonna be an expense at that point in time, which again is an accrual component because we're recording the expense at the point in time we consumed it to generate revenue, not the point in time that we paid for that, that expense. And we're recording the sale on the, on the point in time that we invoiced or shipped the goods, not the point in time that we actually got paid on that side. All right, so let's sum, let's put our zeros across this thing. Uh, zero, zero, duh, duh, zero, zero. Oh, not there. That scared me. It's not. It's okay. You have an undo button. You don't need to. <laughs> you don't need to have a heart attack. It's. I ruined it. No. Okay. Let's add a sub ledger. I also need to add a sub ledger because now we have an invoice out for B as well. So I'm going to put another column here, selecting this column right click and insert and i'm just going to call this b customer and i'm going to say b customer now owes us uh owes us 2500 let's just say they owe us this amount plus this plus the sales tax so there's b customer so our total sub ledger breaking out what people owe us by customer is now the 1600 plus the sum of these two, I'll just copy the, those two. This is my running balance. So now we have a total of 4,225 that should tie out to our sub ledger once I copy that down, which is representing two customers in our sub ledger that owe us 1,600 and 2,625 uh, respectively, which we'd have to follow up on and make sure that they pay us. Okay. 
Let's go back on over here and let's put some underlines under this. Underline, underline, and then underline. And let's copy that down over here to see that. Let's just copy this down to this. Make sure we're in balance. So now, so now we're, uh, this transaction is in balance. Okay, now let's sum this thing up. This is our last balance and this is gonna be our next balance. So I'll say this is gonna be our balance now, which is gonna be, uh, let's do it down here, equals the sum of the last balance and then that row that we were on, which I know is a little spacey and kind of weird, but I think it makes sense. Let's paste formulas and let's paste formulas and let's paste formulas. Okay. And then I'll get rid of the underlines here because that's not where the underlines should be. Removing the underlines. Okay. So let's copy this down over here as well. I'll just copy this all the way down to here. All right, copy this down to here. Copy this down to here. Does that put us back in balance? Yes. So 52,225 liabilities of the sales tax payable and the equity. So where do we stand now? We've got cash of 20,000. There's our accounts receivable, 4,225. It's an asset, but we're hoping to collect to convert to cash later. How do we collect? We go to the customers that we sent invoices to. That would be given by our sub ledger over here. There's the 4,225, but who do we collect on? Customer A, customer B. This sub ledger will typically be tracked within software like a QuickBooks, often forcing you to make the sub ledger by every time you record something to accounts receivable, requiring a customer name so it can generate the sub ledger. However, if there's a problem with the sub ledger, then that becomes an issue, right? You, you, that could be mess. That could be messy, and then so that's that, and so that so we have that, and then we've got the inventory, which also will have a sub ledger, sometimes tracked within the software, sometimes tracked outside the software, sometimes being done on a perpetual inventory system, being adjusted every time you make a sale with either an invoice or a sales receipt types form or sometimes being on a periodic system where it's not being adjusted every time you record a sale, but rather you do a physical count. You make the adjustment periodically uh, based on your, on, on your external worksheet, which you might do in Excel or possibly using accounting software or whatever other thing you're using, like a Shopify or whatever you're doing. So that then, here's our sub ledger here, showing us the units that we have and the dollar, so here's the units we have representing a dollar value of 28,000. Remembering that this becomes much more complex when you have multiple different units of inventory that you're tracking, so be, right? Because then, then, then you're gonna have to track all of the different types of inventory that you have and so on and so forth, which again comes, becomes complex. And it, it, you have to think about how you're going to deal with the inventory, but basic bottom line, sub ledger in some way shape or form should be tracking not only the unit not only the dollar amount but the units so that we can tie out to what should be physically present in some warehouse or something right and so that and so that ties out here that makes sense we've got the sales tax payable this is money that we have not yet collected but will collect when we collect on the invoice this is money that isn't ours therefore wasn't recorded into revenue but is off income statement because we're just being made into the the government's little collection person, right? So we have to put it here on the balance sheet. And then when we pay it to the government on behalf of the person who in theory paid the tax, the customer, this will go down and will decrease the cash. Uh, so, then, so then we have the equity. So the equity uh, has not been impacted Yet, when you look at a trial balance, but total equity on the balance sheet would include all of this, which adds up to 52,100. 
And on the income statement, we would be breaking out one period, month or year typically, of activity, which in this case represents sales, revenue, invoices sent, even though cash has not yet been collected, of 4,100 cost of goods sold, 2,000 bringing it down, net income therefore at 2,100, which would roll into the balance sheet being part of equity in the closing process, which is often done by software automatically showing on the balance sheet 52,100 or possibly in some software like a QuickBooks or a Xero showing the line item on the balance sheet of net income of uh, this 2,100 uh, which is done on a yearly basis. So so the those softwares typically do things on a yearly basis. They don't kind of roll over on a monthly basis. All right, so there's that one. Uh, okay.